The citizens of Prague went ahead with an uprising on the 6th of May that Sunday that almost had the desired effect of getting Patton to march forward to fight the Russians. But Ike ordered Patton to stand down, and Patton obeyed. And General Jodel and Admiral von Friedeberg signed at Reims at Ike's headquarters on Monday morning. The Russians insisted on a signing ceremony the next day in Berlin because Dernitz had ordered all Germans to continue fighting Russians, still holding out hope that the British and the Americans would split and that the Germans could take up their arms again with their British comrades steamrolling over the Americans and straight on to Moscow. But it was not to be. Himmler had been missing on the 6th of May, so just to be sure, Dernitz wrote a decree dismissing Himmler from any authority, and that had made it safe for the Germans to sign Ike's declaration of surrender to the last soldier on all fronts, including those fighting the Red Army, although the Germans on the British Channel Islands would hold out for another eight days because they'd lived there for five years and knew the Japanese were now making jet airplanes so they could beat the Americans. Accordingly, Eisenhower could not make any predictions. He entertained the theory that the Germans, as a last resort, might try to hold the Russians while letting the Allies through. He noted that the Germans, if they reasoned like human beings, quote, would realize the whole history of the United States and Great Britain is to be generous toward a defeated enemy, close quote, which was underscored by the fact that, unlike the Russians, the Allies observed the tenets of the Geneva Convention, and yet the Germans in December had committed their reserves in Belgium knowing the Russians were preparing the major attack in Poland, and so Eisenhower confessed he did not know quite who he, the German, considers his worst enemy in this war. Close quote. Eisenhower at War, page 739. Himmler had been in Berlin on Hitler's birthday and had been in Lübeck on the 23rd of April. And both Himmler and Speer had been at the Lycian Sanatorium on the 24th that had to be abandoned by the 28th for the Russians to move in. And Lycian's Dr. Gebhardt would hang in 1948 at the same Landsberg prison where Hitler had been confined because Dr. Gebhardt had been found guilty at the doctor's trials for having done absurd medical experiments on prisoners in Auschwitz and Ravensbrück at the Lycian sanatorium. As the mood of disgust about the condition of the camps continued to grow day by day, Himmler then began pressing Bombach, who had been placed in charge of the government air squadron, to provide him with a plane so that he could escape to Prague. Bombach and I decided that we would land him on an airfield already held by the enemy. But Himmler's intelligence service was still functioning. When people fly in your planes, he snarled at Bombach, they don't know where they're going to land. A few days later, as soon as communications with Field Marshal Montgomery had been established, Himmler gave Jodel a letter, asking him to have it passed on to Montgomery. As General Kinzel, the liaison officer to the British forces, told me, Himmler asked for an interview with the British Field Marshal under a safe conduct, conduct but this letter never arrived. Jodel destroyed it, as he told me in Nuremberg. Memoirs by Albert Speer, page 587. Among the American field commanders, sentiment for Berlin, never strong, did not last very long. Fear of running headlong into Russian forces was the major factor. Another was the unforeseen problem of pacifying the sectors already overrun in central Germany, routing food and medical care through a scene of destruction and ruin to millions of slave laborers and displaced persons, all the while administering distribution of bare substance, substance rations to 40 million German civilians and Geneva-mandated rations to 2.5 million military prisoners amid the breakdown of German transport. Eisenhower at War, page 761. 
the twentieth of a, the twentieth of July plot to kill Hitler in nineteen forty four had been the last best chance to pull off a separate peace with Germany in Monty's Operation Goodwood, and American pilots had been told to go ahead and use their own initiative in July of nineteen forty four rather than adhere to the strict bombing targets picked by the British, and in losing Goodwood. Monty had been forced to hand over control to the Americans on the September 1st deadline, and Ike had flown over to tell Bradley and Patton to follow orders only from Ike and to play along carefully with Monty until the British were no longer a threat to the Americans. Rommel had been strafed by an RAF pilot on the 17th of July, three days before the 20th of July assassination plot, and Monty had to abandon Goodwood on the 21st of July when the assassination of both Hitler and Rommel had failed. Chief Muller. If there was some kind of revolt, it was my duty to investigate it. Then about 1700 I got a call direct from Himmler, telling me that a certain colonel of the general staff, von Stauffenberg, was to be taken into custody, if possible, from his office in the Bendlerstrasse, and questioned about his knowledge of the bomb. Himmler told me that Hitler had been lightly wounded but was fully functioning, and that this matter had to be treated with absolute secrecy. He asked me if I had heard any news of this through the Gestapo offices, and I told him that I had not. He stressed repeatedly that I was only to observe matters and take no actions other than the apprehension of Stauffenberg. I must use the utmost discretion when bringing him to my office, and no one was to know who did not have to. Why one would be discreet about an assassin's arrest, arrest eluded me, and I asked Himmler directly. He became very annoyed. But almost immediately I had a call from Kaltenbrunner, who screamed that I was not to involve myself in this, and that General Jutner was in command of all armed SS units by direct order of Himmler. At this point, considering all the information pouring in, I became highly suspicious of Himmler's absence and his constant attempts to play this business down. The next thing I did was to go see Schellenberg in his office. I wanted to know if his people had any information about foreign comment on the attempt. As soon as I walked into his office, I knew at once that there was some funny business afoot. Schellenberg was obviously very frightened. He was on the telephone and immediately hung it up when I came in. Don't forget, I am a trained police officer, and Schellenberg was only a cheap lawyer and a schemer and time server. He was sweating and pulling at his collar, so I asked what was going on. He was very nervous. He said he had no knowledge of any foreign information, but did say he'd heard directly from Himmler, who had ordered him not to involve himself in this. He suggested that this applied to me as well, and told me with some false bravado that everything was being taken care of at the highest levels. I replied with some force that on security matters I was the highest level. To get his reaction I told him that I had personally alerted the Hitler bodyguard and I told him that we were arming the building. At this he became really very frightened, and Schellenberg began twisting around in his chair and said that he did not know. By now I was entirely suspicious of these creatures, and I gave orders that Schellenberg's telephone calls should be monitored at once. The man in charge of monitoring Schellenberg's telephone came and told me that he had overheard conversations between Himmler and Schellenberg that led him to think that Himmler was waiting to see what would happen. He mentioned the name Kerningratz to me and asked if I knew what that meant. Aside from the battle in 1866, it meant nothing. He said Himmler had mentioned it several times, but obviously was being very careful what he said. Himmler apparently was frightened and told Schellenberg to keep as far away from me as he could and tell me nothing. Tell me what? I determined then to lay my hands on this snake and squeeze him, so I told him one of the armed SS officers in charge of the guard in this building to go at once and bring Schellenberg to my office. I told, yeah. You should have seen that creature when he was brought in. He had experience in backstairs manipulating, but no experience in interrogation at all. I looked up and right in his eyes, 
I asked him to explain his part in the Korningratz business, and at once all the fight went out of him. If he'd been frightened before, he was terrified now. I took my service pistol out. Then, of course, he went to pieces and began to weep. That's when I found out about the entire business. If Hitler were removed from office and Himmler put in place of him, a negotiated peace would follow. Himmler would be the head of state and the SS permit, permitted to retain intact as an internal police force. The army would join the Soviets in resisting any Western aggression in the Ruhr, and everyone would be happy. How any person with the slightest knowledge of Stalin could believe this great heap of shit is quite beyond me. He was now terrified that I would shoot him for treason, and he had no idea where he stood, until I told him that, before I take any further action in this case, I would first have to speak with Himmler in person. At first Schellenberg denied knowing where Himmler was, but I soon convinced him to put through a call to Rice Shiny and have him come at once to the Prince Albert building. Himmler was obviously angry with me for interfering in his plans, but as always, he was polite and courteous in front of his staff. I told him quietly that I had very important information for him, matters of state. He hesitated and finally went into my office by himself. I had previously told the guard to keep everyone connected with Himmler out of the room. Schellenberg was locked in his office with no telephones. The guards in front of his door had orders to shoot him if he tried to escape. I pointed to a phone on my desk and told him that I had just spoken with Hitler personally and was aware of what was in progress. At that, Himmler became very pale and said nothing. Once I had control of the situation, I began to interrogate him, but in a careful way to be sure. He looked concerned and asked me very directly what I had uncovered. I only had to say Kerningratz, and he began to twitch in the face. I've never heard the name before, he said. My response was to tell him that I had the entire story from Schellenberg less than an hour before. I reminded Himmler that I had once told him not to trust Schellenberg. He broke in to explain that of course he had heard of plots to replace Hitler or to make peace with this side or that, but he had no sympathy with this sort of thing. He had naturally listened to what was said to learn what was going on. He had advised Hitler, he said very smugly, what was going on, and Hitler had improved, had approved his course of action. I then wanted to know why I, as head of internal counter-espionage and security, had not been informed about this. Himmler rolled his eyes and said that these things had to, had best be kept very secret. I would have been notified when Himmler had all the evidence in hand. Yes, I told him, and now I had evidence from others, which certainly was not favorable to a number of people in the SS leadership. I mentioned Gottlob. Berger, the head of the main office and Hitl Himmler's chief supporter. Berger was the man most responsible for the organization and supply of the armed SS. I think you know that the SS was outside the regular military and had to equip itself and secure recruits on its own. There were two men who were vital to Himmler's armed SS. One was Pohl, who raised the cash, and the other was Berger, who raised troops mostly from Eastern Europe, initially from racial Germans, and then later almost anyone who was warm. You see, a number of senior SS officials decided that Germany was likely to lose the war. They had their own empire to think about, and eventually, about 1943, they decided that they would get rid of Hitler and put Himmler up as the head of state. They were connected, as I found out later, with all the small resistance groups, as well as with the enemy, both in the East and West. They could cover their tracks because they had the police power, and I must say with some embarrassment that I had no specific knowledge of this. I did, however, know about how they were going to finance their empire, even after the war. It was the Bernard operation. Q. Counterfeit money. Chief Mueller, exactly so. The faking of British and American currency had a double purpose. The first was to cause economic havoc with the economy of both countries and to get funds to pay for intelligence operations and put away something for themselves. I objected to it on these grounds. 
When I complained to Himmler earlier about the enrichment aspect of this, he told me to mind my own business. I wonder how much he had put away. Q. As much as you had? Chief Muller, I am sure not. He was basically very moralistic and would have been horrified at taking as much as I did. But then you see, I'm here and he's off in the woods somewhere. It's far better to be a live dog than a dead lion, don't you think? Gestapo Chief, page 164 through 70. Walter Schellenberg had been the SS leader in charge of interrogating the two spies, who had shown up at Venlo in November of 1939 on the Dutch-German border, the month after the British had declared war on Germany. And the two spies were Major H. R. Stevens and Captain S. Payne Best, and were linked to the assassination attempt against Hitler that had failed the day before on the 8th of November and the British spy network would be completely reorganized by the 22nd of July in 1940, and the 20th of July conspirators in 1945 would work closely with Dutch spies called the Kaiser Circle. Chief Muller Hiller always felt that the British were trying to assassinate him. Stauffenberg, through his wife's family, had British connections. The actual bombs and fuses were British in origin, but we later determined that they had not come from Abwehr, German Navy stores, and were not intended for use specifically against Hitler. Q. Now you see you were accusing the OSS of doing this, Chief Muller. A oh, small joke. Q. How did the Abwehr get British explosives and fuses? Chief Muller. The Abwehr had control of the entire SOE network in Holland, and the British dropped tons of weapons and sabotage equipment into the Abwehr's hands. After the 20th of July, Canaris was not charged, even though a number of his closest associates were involved in treason. Himmler protected him almost to the last. Then in April of 1945, an officer accidentally found the diaries at the army headquarters hidden in a safe. These were turned over at once. I showed the diaries to Hitler. He read over them carefully and told me to keep them safely in my custody. The photographs of selected pages were to be given to Kaltenbrunner, and he later gave them to Hitler. Q. The originals? I mean, what happened to the originals? Chief Muller. I kept them in my safe. Q. Are they still safe? Chief Muller, good enough. Q. What was in the diaries? Chief Muller, these idiots put everything down on paper. My problem in dealing with the traitors was not to find important papers, but to decide which important papers were really important. Everyone from Stauffenberg on kept diaries, made notes, and wrote all kinds of justifying documents, which they kept locked up in desks, safes at their offices, or in other equally easy-to-find places. Canaris was no different, even though as an intelligent chief, he should have known better. Intelligence chief, he should have known better. Q. But the actual contents of his diaries were, Chief Muller, the same as everyone else, to justify himself and his actions. It was a record of contacts with both the West and East by various high-level officials of the government, religious persons, and so forth. By the way, these religious gentlemen were the worst of all. Although I am a churchgoer, I agree with Borman when it comes to the bleeding sheep of the Lord. These moral pests all assumed that God wanted them to kill Hitler, and that anything they did was acceptable because they had their collars on backwards. And they were the very first to inform on their friends, their friends' friends, and anyone else they could think of. I personally preferred not to interrogate these creatures if I could help it. I had to interrogate, interrogate Canaris on several occasions, and he was a real Greek, that one was. He had answers for everything and none of them the truth. He should have sold carpets somewhere and kept out of the military. His diaries were his death warrant in the end. There was a plot to seize Hitler using the Brandenburg Division, which had been plotted right down to the last detail, except, of course, they forgot to talk to the commanding officer or anyone on his staff. It came as a great shock to them later when the commander absolutely refuted their program and would not support them when he was interrogated. 
You have to understand, these idiots were arrested or detained and at once blabbed everything they knew to the Gestapo. I never had to mistreat anyone at all. It wasn't necessary. I personally ordered these men to have the July 20th prisoners executed at once. The major criminals had already paid the penalty for their deeds, but the Canaris gang remained, and there were also some still in jail in Berlin awaiting trial or under sentence. As far as I was able to, I carried out Hitler's orders. Canaris and his gang were hanged at their prison, and the others taken out and shot, some of them at the last minute before the Russians arrived to save them. I must tell you very clearly that I have no problem with carrying out that order, and if I have any regrets today, it is that I missed a few along the way. Gestapo Chief, page 152-68 through 68. FDR and Ike had strung the British along until the very end of Hitler's war, and the big problem had been keeping Russia from making a separate peace with Germany. And a large part of Churchill's problem with the Russians had been his abhorrence of their lack of polite manners cultivated by British upper classes, but FDR's reliance on working people for help with his physical disability had taught him the virtue and decency of the working class, as he needed to rely on help to get in and out of his wheelchair all day long. Keeping the Russians from making a separate peace became all the more difficult for FDR when Monty's demands for supplies to do his market garden had made FDR have to cut back on lend-lease to Russia by 40%. Everyone was asking the big question in March of 1944. Why wasn't Stalin moving towards Berlin? It's difficult to judge what the intentions of the Allies were toward the end of the war. I wouldn't exclude the possibility that they desired to put a still greater burden on the shoulders of the Soviet Union and to bleed us even more. Or perhaps it's as they explained, they weren't sufficiently prepared for a landing. Their arms production wasn't sufficiently developed. They needed more time and so on. Both explanations were probably true, but I think they were mostly dictated by their desire to bleed us dry, so that they could come in at the last stages and determine the fate of the world. They wanted to take advantage of the results of the war and impose their will not only on their enemy, Germany, but on their ally, the USSR, as well. Khrushchev remembers, page 223 and 4. On the 29th and 30th of September in 1941, over 33 Jew communists had been shot near Kiev at Babi Yar, and when Stalin heard that his faithful commissars were being buried in mass graves by Germans, the Russian counteroffensive began on the 5th of December in 1941, and two days later, Pearl Harbor was bombed by the Japanese. For the foreseeable future, Stalin did not make war on Japan because he would need them as allies if the British succeeded on garnering a coalition to attack him and overthrow the motherland. Monte had been dragging his feet, waiting until the Russians charged towards Berlin, at which point Monte could seize the initiative to gallantly oppose them liberating German POWs as he went, and giving them the weapons and supplies that Monty had been carefully stashing away, all that endless lend-lease equipment he'd been demanding since D-Day. Some of those supplies could be sold to the Germans for cash, the market part, and some would simply be given away in the garden part, but for some reason the Russians had halted and would not move towards Berlin. And for Monty, that was frustrating and maddening, and it would be discovered years later that Kim Philby and his friends had been apprising the Russians of all Monty's schemes in excruciating detail on a daily basis. In October of 1944, Churchill had gone to Moscow to ask Stalin to give up the southern Polish oil fields, and Stalin had just said no. And America had continued to side with the Russians and refused to accept Britain's accusations about Soviet imperialism because FDR saw British imperialism as far more dangerous. 
In July of 1945, a meeting was held in a suburb of Berlin called Potsdam at a former palace of the Kaiser, and Truman had been president for 90 days, and the main currency in Germany was Lucky Strike cigarettes, and nine days into the Potsdam conference, Churchill excused himself to go home and lose an election. Throughout the war, the newspapers had been talking up German superiority and, <clears throat> to the world at large, news of the Russian victories overshadowed everything. In world capitals, Russian successes, compared with the German triumphs of 1940, raised the question, how do they do it? Observers noted that what made the Russian success even more remarkable was the fact that the Germans had expected the attack in Poland and for weeks had published details of Russian con concentrations and accurate forecasts of where the blows would fall. And yet within 72 hours the Russians had demolished German defenses on a 200-mile front and encircled Warsaw and Lodz and in another 72 hours had advanced over 100 miles along the road to Berlin. The press groped for explanations. American Lendlease had equipped the Red Army with trucks and clothing. Allied strategic bombing campaign that winter was a direct factor in the Russian successes. But the fact remained that the Red Army, <clears throat> written off in 1941 and 1942, had survived and gathered strength. Contradicting those who as late as the fall of 1944 had predicted that the Russians would be too exhausted to overcome determined resistance beyond the pre-war pre -war frontier, and estimated 450 divisions advanced 300 miles through western Poland, Bulgaria, western Romania, Budapest, and northern Yugoslavia, spreading destruction and terror on a vast front. The spectacle aroused misgivings about Soviet domination of Eastern Europe and even muffled pity for the Germans. But little could be done, and fatalism set in as word emerged of the German death camps uncovered by the Russians at Auschwitz and elsewhere, evidence of German crimes beyond imagination. The Red Army was bent on avenging twenty million Russian lives, <clears throat> and many quietly concluded that what the Russians did now was up to them. Eisenhower at War, page 677. Ike went ahead with his surrender ceremony at Reims on the 7th of May that was to take effect on the 8th, and then von Friedeberg was taken to sign again in Berlin on the 8th of May while the British took Eberhard Kinzel into company custody. The Berlin surrender document wasn't finished until one thirty in the morning on the ninth, but they called it the 8th. And when the surrenders were signed, there remained a well-equipped German army of 400,000 troops in Norway and plenty more all over the world that just needed a little resupply to turn around to fight the Russians under Monty's command and the total available was somewhere around 880,000 German soldiers, so Ike set up the Rheinwiesenlager, Rheinwiesenlager POW camp specifically to keep all the German POWs from joining up with the British. There were 19 of these Rheinwiesenlager enclosures, where Ike called the German prisoners DEFs, or Disarmed Enemy Forces, rather than POWs, because the Geneva Convention had lost its meaning in the face of the condition of Germany's work camps. Before the Americans had crossed the bridge at Remagen, the British and Americans had been holding an equal amount of German POWs, but after the bridge at Remagen, the British were refusing to hold any more POWs, and by the first week of May in 1945, Ike's Rheinwiesenlager holding pens contained over three million surrendered German soldiers. On the 9th, Accusing Flensburg of failing to implement the Reims ceasefire on time, Eisenhower ordered Dernitz, Keitel, and Jodl arrested forthwith, an action held up for several days by a flurry of British objections. Eisenhower, at war. Page 804. 
On the 9th of May, at 4 p.m., 20,000 Germans surrendered at Dunkirk, followed at 4.30 by the 12,000 Germans on Bornholm Island in the Baltic Sea, but they had needed to be persuaded by the Soviet Air Force, after which the 160,000 waiting in Latvia in the Kurland pocket surrendered to the Russians on the 10th of May, but the very last to capitulate in defeat were the Germans at Trieste. The Americans and Russians, who met at Torgau on the Elbe, sixty miles south of Berlin on the 25th of April, had been getting along famously, and the British, the British radio had announced the Himmler Agreement in hopes the Russians would turn on the Americans for having left Russia out of the surrender terms, but Stalin knew that the British had been all ready to go with Operation Pike on the 15th of May in 1940, but that Hitler's march into France on the 10th had put that operation on hold. Pike had been a plan for the British and the French to bomb Russia so that Stalin could not help Germany, although why not just bomb Germany? The British claimed to have hesitated to bomb Russia for fear it would make Russia join with Germany, and that would have made the Germans unstoppable. In the wake of Operation Pike, on September 11, 1941, the Americans broke ground for their new military headquarters called the Pentagon, and it would be completed and open for business on the second day of the Casablanca Conference and it is important to know that Stalin had offered Hitler the Ukraine if he would call off Barbarossa. On the night of the 9th of May in 1945, the first Ukrainian met up with Patton near Chemnitz, and 858,000 German soldiers surrendered to the Russians, while another 150,000 took to the road towards the west, and by the 11th of May, all battlefields went silent. The newspaper headlines had been promising more war on the 4th of May, that Dernitz was determined to continue the fight against Bolshevism, but the zeitgeist of the world was that once Berlin had fallen, the war was over, and in that Monty had been right. The Germans were done, and the Americans were done, and the Russians were done, and the French were done, and no matter what, no matter that Monty and Churchill weren't done, the fact remained that the English and the Irish and the Welsh and the Scots were done, and so were the Danes and the Norwegians and the Belgians and the Dutch and, of course, the Italians, and so it was over. Everyone took down their blackout curtains and turned on the bar lights and opened up the dance halls while an enormous celebration swept over the whole earth and Monty squeezed what was left of his mind through the legal language of his documents, and he transmitted a few more telegrams that were thrown in waste baskets or simply ignored, and the sun came up, and the moon went down, and Potsdam convened to begin a new world as the State of Israel was born on the 14th of May in 1948, and it had been a hard winter, but now it was spring, and the world was being reborn. FDR had gotten wind of what was going on in Europe back in the 30s, that the British had wanted Hitler to squash Russia for them, and that Britain was helping Hitler to build up an army to do it. So FDR had started sending trucks and food and equipment to Stalin, because America had many Russian friends thanks to Hoover's food assistance program after the Great War. Hitler and Stalin had wanted to keep the perfidious Brits out of Poland, while America had more business ties with Germany and with Russia than with Britain. So when Britain declared war on Germany over Poland, FDR had continued to side with Russia and with Germany. America had recognized the Soviet government when Hitler was elected in 1933. And while the British press was saying that Hitler was going to invade England, FDR knew that was not true and had stayed neutral over Poland and France. The Chamberlain deal had been about giving back the port of Danzig to Hitler, giving back the port of Danzig to Hit to 
giving back the port of <laughs> the Chamberlain deal had been about giving back the port of Danzig to Hitler, and with the German navy allowed to build ships again, the Royal Navy in Britain could demand more money from Parliament, and the Chamberlain Agreement was why Hitler had gone into Poland in the first place, because Chamberlain had given him permission to take back what had been stolen from him in the Versailles Treaty. Hitler had also wanted Alsace-Lorraine, back where the spoken language was German. Hitler also wanted Alsace-Lorraine back, where the spoken language was German, but France had a treaty with Poland that had been brokered by the British. So if Britain declared war over Poland, they would be able to invade Belgium, abandon France in a dramatic defeat at Dunkirk, give France to Hitler so the Americans would come over to save the French, and when the Americans lost the Battle of Normandy, Britain's debts to the U.S., from the Great War would be expunged. The British could invite the whole American army to use England as a staging area, and there the British would know the full extent of American military capability, and as soon as France fell, the French would be obviously siding with the enemy, a clear impetus for the British to move into North Africa and dislodge the French from the Mediterranean, beginning with the sinking of the French fleet. FDR sent the American army over to monitor the British, and Rommel was sent to North Africa to help the French keep the British out, and when FDR confronted Churchill about the murder of the French Admiral Darlin, Churchill's cold dismissal turned FDR firmly against him, ally or not. When Churchill and FDR met for the first time in Newfoundland in August of 1941, the Republican Supreme Court had just decided that FDR's New Deal was unconstitutional. But because the programs were already in place, and people liked them, Congress continued to fund them. FDR spoke French and German, but not as well as Patton, who preferred French. And the French had actually asked the Germans to come save them from the British, who had been planning to land in North Africa for quite some time, even well before their Ethiopian adventure ended in failure. On the 23rd of May, in 1945, the Americans told the British to arrest the Dernitz government in Flensburg, when the Americans finally showed up to tell them it was over and von Friedeberg died of cyanide poisoning that day while in British custody, and so did Eberhard Kinzel. Von Krosick would be sentenced to ten years for looting the Jews, looting the Jews, but was released after one year on amnesty, and Jodl was sentenced to hang along with nine others at Nuremberg, and Jodl's last words would be, I greet you, my eternal Germany. Von Friedeberg had been the only one to sign all three surrenders, and Himmler was brought to Lüneburg on the day the Americans shut down the Flensburg government, and Himmler also died of cyanide, cyanide poisoning in British custody that day. The British made a bad showing of it in Yugoslavia in the month of May, specifically at Bleiburg, where when the communist partisans who had been supported by the British helped in massacring all the people who had helped the Germans or the Americans, and uncounted mass graves were left in their wake. When the British took Himmler into custody, the BBC announced that Himmler died while, quote, biting down on the doctor's fingers, close quote, and those words came out in a newspaper report after enough people had seen the doctor's injuries for word to have spread that there had been a struggle. It was said to have taken 12 minutes for Himmler to die, and although the bruises on his corpse were consistent with a forced suicide, the British story was that Himmler had been biting down on a cyanide capsule while a doctor tried to save his life by extracting it from between his teeth, and the British buried Himmler's body, but nobody survived who could reveal the grave site for doing an op for doing an autopsy, and at the time it simply didn't matter that one more Nazi was dead and everyone just wanted to move on. Many complaints, many complaints 
reached Reims about facilities maintained for American prisoners of war who had been released and were awaiting shipment back to the United States, and the complaints were serious enough to warrant an inspection trip by Eisenhower to Camp Lucky Strike near Le Havre, in company with several visiting U.S. Senators, including Burton Wheeler of Montana, Albert W. Hawks of New Jersey, and Homer Capehart of Indiana, pre-war isolationists who had been outspoken advocates of quote-unquote finishing the job in Europe that meant confronting the Russians. At the sprawling Lucky Strike complex, the group toured the mess halls and bunkhouses with a throng of camp administrators and troops. Eisenhower carefully inspected the the accommodations, sampled the food, and rigorously quizzed the camp personnel. He overlooked nothing, and, before leaving, paused to address the soldiers of Camp Lucky Strike in his familiar stump style. He reminded the men about the plans for shipping them home aboard spacious, comfortable commercial liners. He offered them a choice. They could go home as planned, or double bunk day and night to, quote, get home double time, close quote. Amid the tumultuous roar of cheers and applause, one of the senators turned to butcher. I hope that fellow never decides to run against me in my state. He's got what it takes. I can see now why the G.I.s worship him. He speaks their language. He isn't high hat like you expect from the brass. He knows their problems, and they know it. Eisenhower at War, page 811 and 12. The book Blood and Honor told the story of a ten-year-old boy sent to a Hitler youth camp in Czechoslovakia, where a teacher with his hand in a metal brace from an injury he'd gotten in the Great War used the brace to hit the boys, especially when he'd been drinking. The locals would murder the boys if they were caught away from the school, and so the boys had grown close in their mutual suffering, and when Hitler's war ended, the author described himself and other starving boys riding a train that was traveling back towards Germany, and the train was being strafed and bombed by Americans and British and Russian planes. And, while sick and starving and dying... The boys finally came across some real German soldiers, and an officer told them that the Americans were only a few miles away and that the Americans would take good care of the boys. But an SS officer overheard it and shot the German officer dead on the spot, accusing him of talking about surrender, and then the SS man said, Heil Hitler, and walked away. The next time the train stopped, the boys learned that Hitler was dead and wept like babies, and they were finally stopped by an Austrian mob looking for Nazis to kill, but the boys were saved by Russian and British prisoners of war who turned them over to the Americans, and most of the boys had studied English for four years in school, so they had no trouble speaking with the American soldiers, and this author had turned 13 years old in 1945 when the Nazis had given him a gun and some grenades, even though he wasn't able to throw the grenades very far during practice. <clears throat> On the 9th of May, General George Taylor, assistant division commander of the 1st Infantry Division, accepted the final surrender from Germany's General Theodore Osterkamp, and the ceremony took place in Elbogen, Czechoslovakia, in a small tavern called Zum Wiesenross, or the White Horse Inn. During the ceremonies at the tavern, General Osterkamp tried to stall for time. He asked <clears throat> whether the date line Elbogen, Elbogen, Czechoslovakia was not in error. To my knowledge, General Osterkamp said, this is Elbogen, Sudetenland. I translated the general's concern to General Taylor, who flushed from his collar on up and shouted, You tell him that there is no such goddamn place as Sudetenland. We are here in Czechoslovakia, and that's the way the document will read. I translated General Taylor's words into idiomatic German to retain their flavor. General Osterkamp immediately picked up the pen, signed the document, and the ceremonies were over. Klaus Barbie, the shocking story of how the U.S. used this Nazi war criminal as an intelligence agent by Erhard Dobringhaus, Washington, D.C., Acropolis, Acropolis Books Limited, 1984, page 45. 
There had been one more piece of funny business before the bulge in the form of a minor attack on Alsace, <clears throat> to which Monty had demanded that Ike respond, and Ike knew that Monty's proposition would not only have isolated those Americans on the other side of the Faustus Mountains, but would have given the Germans an opportunity to cut off the American supplies coming up from Marseille. Marseille. Strasbourg was 100 miles south of Frankfurt, and if Strasbourg were not defended, the Germans would have taken severe reprisals against any Strasbourgians who had helped the Americans. And Ike knew the fervor with which the true French were willing to take up antiquated arms against the de Gaullist Free French, and knew they would rather fight alongside the Vichy and welcome the Germans back than submit to England's de Gaulle. So Ike decided to keep the American army in Strasbourg, from where they could more easily march east towards Austria than if they were up north filling the gap left by Bradley's filling the gap made by Monty's Arnhem, Arm, Arnhem adventure. Bradley's troops went north to Bradley's troops went north to fill Monty's gap while Patton stayed in place and the Strasbourgians enjoyed their welcome American friends, and this was what had left the Americans so very thin in front of the Ardennes forest. Churchill had flown over to threaten Ike with civil war in France if the Americans did not defend Strasbourg, and these troops had thus not been available to respond during the bulge. <clears throat> Listening to the soft Norman rain splash the trees outside, the supreme commander paced the wooden floors of the map tent at his shell-burst advance headquarters at Granville at the base of the Contentin Peninsula. Dwight Eisenhower was waiting, patient and determined, for his visitor. He thought he knew exactly what Charles de Gaulle wanted this rainy August day. Paris. He was determined that he should not yet have it. He should not have it yet. Like de Gaulle, Eisenhower had learned a few hours earlier of the outbreak of fighting in the city. He had been, quote-unquote, damned mad. When he found out about it, in his view, the Paris uprising posed, quote, just the kind of a situation I didn't want, a situation that wasn't under our control, that might force us to change our plans before we were ready for it, close quote. It was to force a change in those plans, <clears throat> Eisenhower was sure, that de Gaulle was coming to his shell-burst headquarters. He resented it. He saw it as another example of de Gaulle's annoying habit of, quote, trying to get us to change our plans to accommodate his political needs, close quote. For this American general at the head of the Allied armies, quote, the political aspects of Paris were secondary, close quote. <clears throat> He had only one concern, fighting Germans. He would let nothing, not even Paris, slow him down. As he heard the footfalls of his approaching visitor, he vowed once more, quote, not to let myself get committed to Paris, close quote. Dour and moody, Charles de Gaulle stepped over the wet grass leading to the supreme commander's tent. He had come home that morning, in a plane running out of gas, to an almost empty airstrip manned by an indifferent functionary, to shave with a borrowed razor blade, in order to lead his country. It was a nation in which millions knew his voice, but did not know his face. He was a ghost to those millions, an ideal. He had now to give himself flesh and blood to embody the ideal which must now become a political reality. For him, the political aspects of Paris were supreme, with its communists already clamoring for authority. Charles de Gaulle had failed. Eisenhower had not agreed to modify his plans to move immediately on Paris. For the stooped and solemn man walking back to Marmier's plane, Eisenhower's answer now posed a cruel dilemma. It had faced de Gaulle with a terrible decision. A few moments before he had, he had hinted to the frowning American before him what it might be. Stiffly correct, 
De Gaulle had told Eisenhower the liberation of Paris was a matter of such prime importance to France that, if he had to, he was prepared to withdraw the second French armored division from the Allied command and send it to Paris on his own authority. Paris, for de Gaulle, was so crucial he was prepared to tear asunder four years of Allied unity to get it. Is Paris burning? Page 144 through 7. The footnote read, Eisenhower had smiled. He'd not taken the polite threat that seriously. He was convinced the second armor, quote, couldn't have moved a mile if I didn't want it to and wouldn't have, close quote. Later, at a tenser moment of the war, during the Battle of the Bulge, de Gaulle was to make a similar threat, this time about the divisions of the French First Army the Supreme Commander wanted to pull out of Strasbourg. Then an angry Eisenhower told him, General, I'll keep those troops in Strasbourg as long as I can, but if you want to take those divisions back, you go right ahead. Just remember one thing, you won't get one more cartridge, one more pound of supplies, or one more gallon of gasoline. But if you want those divisions back, General, you go right ahead and take them back. 8 November 1944 We also had our weekly meeting with Sherwell and Sandys on the flying bomb and the rocket. I am afraid that most of these are likely to interfere with the working of Antwerp Harbor, a matter of the greatest importance in the future. I then had an interview with Joubert de la Ferta and he gave me some interesting sidelines on Mountbatten's HQ. He said that the Anglo-American relations continued to be bad, the Americans full of criticism of our management of India, and expressing open, openly the opinion that if they had their way, there would be no British Empire after the war! Exclamation point. War Diaries, Allenbrook, page 619. And so problems remained, though accounts of Eisenhower's early February trip convey a feeling that the worst was over. Malta had come and gone, the Yalta meetings were continuing, but the Allies had had weathered the German counteroffensive. In the years ahead, Eisenhower would occasionally reflect back on the folly of the German V-weapon program, which had been a prestige whip weapon pushed at the expense of jet aircraft production. That week, V-weapon attacks on Antwerp reached a peak, and yet millions of tons of supplies moved through the port practically without a hitch. Many, including spats, felt that the Germans might have been in a position to fight the war to a stalemate as late as January had the ME-262 jet been in full production. Eisenhower at War, page 675. Two bad, vile Dungans, shabby Furstenhof Hotel, where an Odor of antiseptics still clung to the rooms that had been used by the Germans as hospital wards. The news of Hitler's death came on the evening of May 2 from Radio Hamburg with three rolls of muffled drums. Six months before, that announcement would have called for wild celebration. Now it passed almost unnoticed, for on the eve of Germany's collapse, the death of Hitler had been overshadowed by the greater tragedy of the nation whose destruction he had wrought. Grand Admiral Dernitz, the submariner, submariner whose U-boats had sighted victory in their periscopes only three years before, had been named Hitler's successor. He went on the air with a pretentious pledge to continue the war against the Bolsheviks. Himmler's whereabouts were undisclosed, although intelligence reported peace feelers attributed to him. When Dittmar, who was then being held at group for interrogation, was told of Himmler's bid for peace, he dismissed it scornfully. Himmler, he de declared, could command no following whatsoever in the German army. Bradley, page 533 and 4. There were mountains of weapons and ammunition laying around that the British could have used to rearm the German POWs. And to get the Russians and the Americans into shooting war, 
may have been as easy as having the British SAS fire at the Russians in Berlin and blame it on the Americans, then fire on the Americans while blaming it on the Russians. But everybody was so drunk by that time that most of the sniper fire was ignored as celebratory. The Germans had, invent had invented Taben and sarin gas. From studying the effects of Jakefoot, the Americans had suffered during prohibition from poisoned alcohol. And the German people had been told that if they lost the war, Hitler would mercifully gas the whole country to spare them the shame of defeat. But as long as they refused to surrender, they would be allowed to live a little while longer. While the first new German submarines were going into the water in the fall of 1944 in order to help the Japanese, bomb-proof underground oil refineries were gearing up in both Japan and in Germany, capable of producing 300,000 tons of synthetic gasoline every month, and in four or five months the Germans could have been making jet planes in other underground factories a thousand or more every month, and while the Allies had no, oh, while the Allies had not even begun building a single jet aircraft. The complex at Nordhausen alone had 40 miles of underground tunnels making V-2 rockets and jet airplanes, and the Germans could have won the war if only they had fed their worker prisoners better. Russia would have been easily overrun in Barbarossa, except that the German army had to keep pausing for the SS Jew-killing squads to catch up, and the generals begged Hitler to allow their waiting soldiers to turn south and go after the Caucasian oil fields, because no German general wanted to march into Moscow, where there were so many Jews living that murdering them would have taken too much time, and the army would have had to become involved in that horrible business, so Hitler allowed half of his Barbarossa army to turn south, while the other half... <clears throat> succumbed to the Russian winter, waiting for the SS to do their work. And while the Americans were keeping the Japanese from being able to attack Russia, the SS were being further slowed down by Russian peasants cleverly, but not cleverly enough, hiding Jews in their basements and in their barns. Chief Muller, oh yes, Stalin had commissars attached to all military units, Actually, they controlled them, even ordered the commanders of the units to obey them. Most of these officials were Jewish and had a reputation for being fanatical communists and very brutal. In fact, most of the higher-level party people were Jews at the time. Gestapo, Gestapo chief, page 29. <clears throat> when the war continued to drag on, feeding the prisoners became more of a struggle than Germany could bear and it seemed at the time more humane to send them to the scientific gas chambers than to allow them to starve to death, and shooting them outright had simply been too terribly, too terrible to con had simply been too terrible to continue with the job. Extermination had not been the initial program because it had taken the Nazis nine years to get to the extermination stage after doing all they could to chase their victims out of the Reich and two-thirds died in the camp, while a third were murdered out in the open. In August of 1942, the Nazis had 800,000 people working for Germany in the scientifically designed camps, and by the next year they had increased that to three and a half million. At the end of 1944, there were seven million concentration camp inmates doing useful work, yet it was not enough, because Stalin had even more comrades working away for him, and yet neither leader could match the 65 million Americans pouring their hearts and souls into industrial labor towards winning the war, and two and a half million of them were Rosie the Riveters, and to the war work was added the 11 million Americans serving in the armed forces. 
America was spending twice what Germany and Japan were paying combined, and Germany had begun to suffer as people were hired due to party loyalty rather than competence, and instead of rewarding good workers in the concentration camps, they were being punished for being Jew communists. The camps had been intended not only to support themselves, but also to make money for Germany. But the sabotage and escape attempts by prisoners made the idea of forced labor cumbersome, cumbersome and unproductive, and it took more effort to provide jobs for the prisoners than it did to simply police them. As the war wrenched down on Germany, the expense of disease-ridden inmates and the incredible volume of prisoners, now bloated with Russian POWs, was relieved only by the ratcheting up of the extermination program, where at least some of the inmates could be given something useful to do. In addition to collecting and sorting the belongings of new arrivals being unloaded from the trains, then registering them, delousing them, and providing them with prison uniforms, they could now be escorted to the gas chambers, and then the inmates were put to work disposing of the bodies, and this became the only actual labor performed within the barbed wire. The concentration camps had become more like prisons than work centers because it took too much time to police the inmates rather than simply treating them as prisoners. <clears throat> Decent Germans working jobs outside the camps that could have been done by prison labor were doing those jobs at a much lower price than the cost of setting up factories inside the camps and not only was bringing that work to within the confines of a concentration camp too expensive but it supplanted the space needed to house the prisoners so the design of many of the camps as places as being places of employment rather quickly went by the wayside when more Germans working regular jobs had been needed as soldiers, the camp administrators had at first made attempts to provide useful work for the prison laborers, and all the Jew bashing had gone a long way towards making it possible for inmates to be taken by truck every day to some work site needing hands now fighting on the battlefront because being under guard by camp managers kept Jews safe from being attacked by the local people who were now all worked up as their kinsmen were being killed in action on the front lines. The same held true for Russian POWs who, who were in danger for their very lives outside of the safety of the concentration camps and as the difficulty of creating jobs within the camps became an intolerable burden the reality was that the employment programs behind the barbed wire were mostly for show to their superiors as the work camps became mere places of punishment Nazis were disgusted to see Jews die so easily while being transported to the camps and they watched as Jews died more quickly in the camps than their Aryan brothers and trains stopping in the middle of nowhere to throw out the dead were discouraged because it was interfering with Eichmann's careful timetables. The Nazis had believed that Jews would be unable to stand the effort of honest work because they had only survived in the world thus far by being sneaky, and they were thought to be incapable of fighting in battle because they were weak. But Jews did not die quickly enough in the camp, so there would be more room for newcomers carrying booty. So the Nazis took away their coats and their shoes and their food and their medicine, and even with these efforts, Jews turned out to be just as hard to kill as other Germans. For every Jew killed, the Nazis intentionally killed two others to make it seem that they were not just killing Jews. And they had started with Croatian, Russian, and Baltic Jews in 1941, then did the French and Slovak Jews in March of 1942, then Polish and Austrian Jews in April, and the Dutch Jews in July, then the Yugoslavian and Belgian Jews in August, and the Czech Jews in October, followed by the Norwegian and German Jews in December. And nothing bad happened to those few who refused to join in on the Jew killing, because whoever complained was simply transferred to another job. 
Some camps like Dachau were transfer points or hubs, and Sachsenhausen had become a brick factory, had been a brick factory, and Maut Mauthausen was a granite quarry, and Buchenwald had been a limestone quarry, and Treblinka was a gravel pit, and Auschwitz had been known for its Jewish distillery that made famous vodka and brandies. <coughs> Theresienstadt Theresienstadt was set apart for special cases such as exceptionally wealthy Jews and the elderly, and to keep the cleansing and re-education of Germany going, <clears throat> the Nazis would recruit a few senior Jews to set up a Jewish association that would help any newcomers transfer all their money and financial financial assets into the safekeeping <coughs> of the Jewish Association. And after some months of gathering assets, the members of the Jewish Association would be murdered and all the money given to the Reich, and then they would start all over again. The first deportation was on the 13th of February in 1940, and 1,300 Jews were taken by gunpoint from Stettin in Germany, and they were given a waiver to sign, and then sent off to France. And the paper they had signed said that their stuff was safe as long as they kept living in Germany. Jews eagerly signed the waivers to show the Germans how loyal they were, and this was a clever trick accomplished while the Germans were accusing them of being traitors who wanted to betray the fatherland by moving out of the country. This confiscation of Jewish property was accomplished because of the same spirit displayed when they had willingly and proudly donned the yellow star, not just to comply with the law, but to make it obvious to everyone what good German citizens they were. <coughs>